Welcome back, geologists, from our first lecture. We're going to learn now about stratigraphic principles used in geology. So that big word, stratigraphic, what does it mean? It simply refers to rock layers, which is the term strata. You'll learn about that in sedimentary rocks. Strata are the different layers of the earth at the surface, and how we interpret their age is based on their order that they've been laid down in, if they've been reshuffled, if they've been cracked, if they've been moved, if they've been overturned, if they've been folded. So a couple of things we use when we're talking in geology are some basic laws and principles. I would compare them to red, yellow, and green lights in traffic. So just the other day, I was sitting right by campus waiting for the light to turn from red to green, and it turns to green and the car in front of me just sits there. After it stayed green for a while, you can imagine everyone behind me is honking. The person finally looks up and they have been texting. You know the syndrome I'm talking about. Green means go, right? Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. I've traveled all over the world and green lights mean go. Subsequently, red lights mean stop. Now, we can kind of get a different answer for yellow, right? Depending on who you are, yellow means, oh, put the pedal to the metal, but it, what it really means is yield and slow down. So we have those same basic principles in geology, things that we take as fundamentally correct, things that are our foundation to work from, regardless of what language we speak, what continent we're on, what country we may visit, geologists still interpret these principles the same way. Now I want you to look at the structures in the background of this picture. I took this at Hamelin Pool, which is a famous place in Shark Bay, Australia, which is on the far western coast of Australia. That's the most famous place in the world to visit stromatolites. Well, we know that stromatolites today, this is what they look like, should have looked like that in geologic past. So when we get to the end of stratigraphic principles, I'll revisit this thought about stromatolites and say, hey, think about that because we know how they operate today. They should have operated the same in geologic past. That is one of our geologic principles. Now, these principles we're fixing to learn about, there's just a handful of them, but you need to know them backwards and forwards, and they need to come early in the semester so you can interpret what you're learning from this day forward and understand when we say, oh, the law of dot, 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 you'll be able to apply that throughout the semester and even once you leave the course. All right, let's start with the law of superposition. This is Nicholas Steno in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, interesting guy because when he was alive hundreds and hundreds of years ago, he was not very popular to be a scientist. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, he was a priest. <laughs> And uh, he lived in Italy, and he was a priest, studied, though, biology and geology. And he came to this conclusion that rock layers like you see right here, and this is in Australia as well, in Sydney Harbor Bay, uh, you can look at them. And he said it must have taken a very long time for these rocks to be made. And it looks like the stuff down here should be older geologically than the stuff at the top. So Steno noticed that these rock layers showed specific historical patterns and accounts of the Earth's history, and he called that the law of superposition. So let's investigate that a little further. Let's look at Zion National Park. By the way, this photo was taken by uh, Mr. Brad Turner, and Brad did a great shot of looking at down into the Virgin River, that's what this is right here, and all the rock layers that make up Zion National Park. Now, these are all approximately the same age, which is around Jurassic in time. But you can distinctly see different coloration and different layers. So the bottom layers should be older than the top layers. Let me give you a different example. If you were here taking the class with me face to face at the Science Building at MCC, you would notice that there are five stories. The basement layer, there are two of them, basement two and basement one. Above basement one is uh, level one. That would be the ground level to you when you walk in the building. Above that would be the layer of the building in which the geology room is found. That's floor number two. 
above floor number two, there's a lot of biology and chemistry rooms on that top layer that you would call the third floor of the MCC Science Building. So the third floor obviously couldn't have been built before the second floor, the second before the ground level, and neither of those layers could be made without having your base foundation put in at the very, very bottom of the building because you'd be sitting on air. So we would call this basement two, this would be basement one, then stories one, two, and three. So even though they're not numbered the same as our layers of the uh, science building, this would be floor three, floor two, floor one, basement one, basement two. Basement two is the oldest of the bunch. So five is younger than one. And every layer above one subsequently gets younger until you get to the youngest layer on top. Let me throw out there that on occasion, rocks can get out of order. But the law of superposition states that rocks were deposited oldest to youngest. If any rearrangement happens, it happens after those rocks are made. Look at Bryce Canyon National Park. And the layers down here should be older geologically than the layers up here. All right, let's get to the next law, also created by Steno, the law of original horizontality. Focus on the word horizontal. Keep in mind that simply means that layers are laid down flat originally. Yes, they may be made on an angle like this on a slope, but they still, gravity tends to make fairly flat layers of sedimentary rock, even igneous rock at the surface. So these horizontal rocks can get tilted or folded or change their shape after they're made. So the law of original horizontality states that any rock deformation must happen after the rocks are originally laid down flat. So look at this big old chunk of gneiss that I found in Sequoia National Park in, in California. See all these funky curves to the rocks and folds? They weren't made that way. The rock was very much a different orientation and shape and the minerals in it before it was ever laid down. So whenever you have folded rocks like this, that happened after the rock was originally made. The law of lateral continuity, also a steno principle. Lateral continuity, remember layers one, two, three, and four, one would be the oldest because of the law of superposition. They were all laid down flat because of the law of original horizontality. All right, so we get some down cutting by a river. Let's just call this the Colorado River where the Grand Canyon ends because this is supposed to be a diagram of the Grand Canyon. So this would be the bottom layers down here. The bottom layers are the oldest. We know that even in the Grand Canyon because they're billions of years old and the youngest layers are several hundred million years old. So would you all say that three and four should be the same layer they were up here, weren't they? All we did was erode some of it away, take it away. We moved those sediments out. That still means that layer four on either side of that canyon wall is the same. Same thing with layer three. They've just been separated by air now. So that's one part of lateral continuity. The second part would be an example from cooking that I can give you called pinching out. My first cooking assignment when I was getting my cooking merit badge in Girl Scouts was to make a cake. I was so excited. I was like, okay, I'm going to cook this cake. I made my favorite flavor, double fudge, and I got the biggest and bestest pan I could find in my mom's um, pantry. I didn't read the instructions of what size pan to get. I was just in a big hurry to get this cake made so I could get my little merit badge to put on my, my uh, sash that I wore them all on. So I make my batter and get, mind you, I had a batter for a pan, you know, a regular size pan, and I got this ginormous size pan, and I start putting my batter in the middle. So you can imagine the middle has this hump, and gravity starts to pull that cake batter out, and it never reaches either side of the pan. I'm like, what's up with this? What had happened was the law of lateral continuity. The biggest source of the batter was in the middle where it was being put in. So equate that to maybe a mountain in the middle of geology and the weathering of those sediments weather out from the mountain until they pinch out like my batter did where they can't go any further. So like my cake batter, 
it couldn't reach the edges of the pan because there just wasn't enough of it to fill the pan. So that happens to rock layers in nature where we weather them, but they just don't get enough to completely cover the entire globe or even an entire region. So we may find one rock layer in a region, but another is missing 100 miles away because of the law of lateral continuity. So this is the Grand Canyon, a great look at the law of lateral continuity. When I took this shot, it was right about sunset at the North Rim, and I would tell you that these layers right here match these layers right here. Do you see this marbly layer? That matches this marble layer over here on the South Rim. So that's important to note because those layers are the, they're the same. They're just separated by some air where erosion came through. All right, another one of Steno's basic geologic principles was the law of cross-cutting relationships. I always like to ask students at this time, have you ever broken a bone or known somebody that has? And most everybody says, of course, and most people say, even I've broken a bone, so bummer if you have, but you can need to answer this question for me for this to work. Ask yourself, did that bone get broken while you were being born? You may be laughing, but it's an important question to ask. Likely the answer is no. If you did, don't use this example for that. Find a different broken bone example. But most of you can say, all right, I was playing sports and I broke a bone, or I slipped and I fell, or you know something like that happened to me. I was in a car wreck, something like that. Well, when you break a bone, you weren't born that way. The break happened after the bone was made. In geology, breaks in rock happen after the rocks were made. There's several different ways a cross-cutting relationship can occur. We can actually have a break in a rock called a fault where rocks move, or we can have another rock cross over a pre-existing rock. You're like, well, how can that be? I thought rocks were solid. Igneous rocks are molten until they harden. So in this example right here, Let's look at layers one, two, three, and four. Notice in this top layer, one, two, three, and four are sedimentary layers that were laid down flat. Now in this diagram, four is a different type of rock. It's an igneous rock known as a dike. That's not a people dike, this is a igneous dike. Igneous dikes are molten magma or lava that reach the surface. And this is cutting across our layers one, two, and three. So four is actually younger than layers one, two, and three. Five is younger than four. Why? Because four did not cross over it. Had four crossed over five, it would be the youngest feature on this diagram right here. There's several interesting cross-cutting relationships on this diagram. First of all, notice the line, okay? That's one cross-cutting relationship. Then find the purple dike right here, and these little blobs of stuff that look like the rock adjacent to it simply are the embedded uh, intrusions of the material that are embedded in this rock to show you that it cut across them. All right, so this would be your first cross-cutting relationship. It's younger than all of these rock layers right here. However, this is not the youngest feature on the diagram. This fault is because it separated the dike. And that means that that's a second cross-cutting relationship. If another last example would help, think about a parking lot or a parking garage. That parking lot has to have stripes put on it, but the stripes don't get put on until the concrete is made and situated and dried. That would be a cross-cutting relationship. When the paint gets put on, it's the youngest feature of the parking lot. Here's another cross-cutting relationship in terms of a fault. So these white layers right here should match up, the brown layers should match up. And notice that the law of original horizontality said that these should have been laid down together flat. So some deformation has occurred after this happened. That deformation happens to be a cross-cutting relationship in the form of a fault. So this fault right here is younger than the layers that it cuts across. All right, the law of inclusions. This is another Steno principle of geology. He stated that any inclusions or things found in rock, by definition, must be older than the rock that they're found in. Okay, so in other words, they came from older rocks. They have to, because they didn't just fall from the sky and get made into that rock. So here's a piece of andesite uh, from Yosemite National Park. 
and see these big black things right here? Those are inclusions. Those happen to be from older rock that were made into this lava rock right here or a granite if it were granite. So it matches this diagram over here. You can see you have rock A, which is older because it's at the bottom, right? Law, law of superposition. Some of A gets weathered and eroded and a new rock B, it gets put into rock B. These didn't get just stuck in after rock B was made. They were pre-existing before rock B ever had a chance to be conceptualized. So the law of conclusion simply states that if you find an inclusion within a rock, another piece of a rock within a rock, that inclusion has to be older than the rock in which it's included inside of. The next principle is referred to as the law of faunal succession. First of all, faunal refers to organisms like animals, that it could include invertebrates, vertebrates, so forth. Uh, when you're looking at flora, that's plants, and so this also applies into the plants as well, but faunal succession really is referring to fossils and the rocks that we find. Now, a different guy came up with this concept. His name is William Smith, and uh, William Smith said that sedimentary rock layers contain specific fossils that existed at a very unique geologic time, and that these fossils succeed each other in vertical rock layers that have been stacked one on top of the other in a very reliable, orderly fashion. Subsequently, we can identify layers simply based on the fossil content that may be inside of them. You're like, wow, that's a lot to take in. All right, let me make it simple for you. Look at this little dude right here. That's a trilobite. Okay, trilobites were some of the first invertebrate fossils of the Cambrian period, which is the very beginning of the modern geologic eon known as the Phanerozoic. Now, way up here in this layer right here is a different animal that could not have existed at the same time this guy did. So let's just change this animal in layer six to be a T-Rex, a Tyrannosaurus rex. Well, T-Rex in no way could be way down here because T-Rex came about about 180 or so million years later than the last time a trilobite was ever alive. Because trilobites went extinct, vacated the planet in reproduction long before any dinosaurs ever came to be. Nor would I expect to find human remains in layer six with this fossil right here, because this fossil's extinct well before humans were ever came to be about. So that's what faunal succession is about. If I find a trilobite in a layer, I automatically know about how old that layer is because trilobites had a very specific range of time in which they existed. And so that range, if you find them, you're like, okay, it has to be at least Cambrian in age and can be no, uh, no younger than Permian in age because that was how long trilobites lived on the planet. This is another look at that. When we correlate faunal succession, we can look at the fossils in different rock layers. For example, if I find fossils down in Permian, some of those fossils may not be evident in tertiary aged rock because they went extinct maybe at the end of the Cretaceous. Like this would be where I'd find a T-Rex right in here, but I would never find a T-Rex down here in Triassic because Triassic didn't have T-Rex. It had other types of fossils. So in fossil stratigraphy, we're simply looking at the fossils that are found in individual rock layers to help us put a clock or a date and narrow the scope about how old that rock can be. We can also use radiometric dating to help us uh, finalize the actual age of a rock layer. But fossils can do a lot for us simply because we know worldwide about how long most organisms existed based on the fossil record. Fossil record meaning what's in the rock itself. All right, the finale of all of the principles, the law of uniformitarianism, sometimes referred to as the principle of uniformitarianism. What a big word for such a simple concept. I need to give you a little history here. This comes from this guy right here, James Hutton. James Hutton is the father of the rock cycle. He's also the father of modern geology. Here's what James Hutton said. He said that basic geologic principles have been in place, meaning the natural laws of nature. These processes like volcanoes, tsunamis, everyday erosion by rivers and deposition by rivers, uh, everyday tide changes and what that does to shorelines, those types of things 
that have operated today must have operated the same way in geologic past, with very little change. He left room to say we have catastrophic events like big tsunamis and big volcanic eruptions and even being smashed by big things coming in from outer space and smashing into Earth. He said those things happen, but our geologic processes basically stay the same over a long period of time throughout the history of the Earth. So his concept was, quote unquote, the present is the key to the past. So let me apply that to the picture that you have here. This is Crater Lake. I went there on my sabbatical, and you're going to learn more about Crater Lake when we get to earthquakes. But this is a big caldera, which used to be a volcano. And you're like, well, duh, there's a volcano right here, right? Well, actually, the big volcano is this thing right here. So this is a new one that's being redone. So what's, what he would mean here, James Hutton said, well, hey, if I'm redeveloping this inside of a caldera, if we know how a caldera forms today, they must have formed the same way in geologic past. Subsequently, if I can see a new volcano forming, if I can see that happening in today's modern geologic time, that must have been how it formed in geologic past. Remember the first picture I showed you in geologic principles of the stromatolites, okay? Remember that? I said I'd revisit it. Here it is. Stromatolites were the creators of oxygen in our atmosphere as we know it today. They must have been the same as they were in geologic past if they match what they are today. Because we know they're very picky about their living conditions. You'll learn more about them uh, when we get to that point in the semester. But essentially, they like very, very shallow water like tidal flats, very salty water, warm water. So that that's what they require today. They must have required that in geologic past as well. So when we find their fossils, we know what kind of environment existed. That's where we're headed with all of this. We use these clues to help us determine a little bit about the history of what we see in the field as geologists. So here's the principle of uniformitarianism applied. This is uh, a very pretty dive that I've been on uh, that is called Pear Tree in Jamaica. And this is an Elkhorn coral. Notice how shallow the water is. I can kind of give you perspective and tell you that the water depth at Pear Tree is probably no more than 20 feet of water and some places much more shallow than that. So if that's the case, why is that important? Well, big branching corals like Elkhorn cannot live in high pressure water past one atmosphere, which can be right around 32 is 33 feet of water. Why is that? The pressure would compound an order of magnitude, which would squash and break the arm. So you can't find large branching corals except for one atmosphere of water. So you're looking at literally 30 feet or so or less of water. So if I find those fossils in rock today, like rock right around here in central Texas, this would be the kind of rock you'd see a lot of right here, a shot right near Valley Mills actually. And if I find coral reef deposits, especially branching corals like this, I know this rock had to form in that same kind of environment. Why? Because the fossils, we can use the fossils or the animals of today, meaning the corals, and say, hmm, if they live that way today, they must have lived that way in the past. The present is the key to the past, not vice versa. Not the past is the key to the present. Okay, We're learning from today and applying that to geologic past since we cannot go back in time. All right, very great example of the present is the key to the past. This is a lava flow, and if you look carefully, you'll see red here and a halo of red right in here. Those are called lava tubes. Lava tubes in Hawaii and other places in the world as well, and in geologic past, but this is the current one that I shot. Uh, look at this. That's going to carry all this lava, keep it molten, and it came to the ocean. These are all my pictures from following this lava flow to here. And when that super cooled and caused a hydrovolcanic eruption, do you see the real dark black beach right here? That's what creates these black sand beaches right here. So if I see black sand that's been lithified or hardened in rock from ancient geologic time, I know this is the process by which it went through because I can learn from the present and apply that to the past. The present is the key to the past. When you look at Mount St. Helens here, I want you to think about, hmm, if I find this kind of lava 
or I find a lahar, which is a mud flow, that's what this is right in here actually, or pyroclastic debris, then I might know that this kind of environment might have caused it. So you'll be learning more about Mount St. Helens in the future and we'll apply what you've learned today and revisit that when we get to that point in the semester in test three for volcanoes. This would be a great place to take a break and I'll see you back for the next lecture soon. Bye.